Andre, I've been just overwhelmed by your and your colleagues' approach to eternal chaotic inflation and what it may mean to the universe. And, and then I was frankly fascinated and frankly surprised to see that you began talking about consciousness in several of the papers that you've written as something that if we avoided, which frankly most physicists would do, if we avoid consciousness, we're artificially limiting our ability to understand what's really going on. I, 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 I'm just fascinated by that. Um, well, uh, as you understand, uh, consciousness is not exactly my profession. But uh, doing quantum cosmology requires us to think about this. And why requires? Let me give you an example. Um, in '67, uh, the father of quantum cosmology, Bryce DeWitt, have written a famous paper, which was actually so large that it was published only after it was subdivided into three. And in this paper, uh, he asked, uh, the question, so let's write equation, Schrodinger equation for the wave function of the universe. Uh, Normally we do that for a small particle, yeah, and now yeah, we're doing right. it for the whole universe. So wave function in quantum mechanics is some object which, if you take a square of it, gives you the probability to find something in a given state. Okay? So quantum mechanics is supposed to be universally applicable. So let's apply it to the universe, so to everything. And here I've written this equation, and this equation looks like that. Well, time derivative of the wave function, which uh, shows you how fast this wave function change, is proportional to the energy of, uh, well, associated with this wave function. Formally, it is Hamiltonian multiplied by wave function. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Hamiltonian tells you how large is the energy of everything. But then what he found and noticed it, that actually the total Hamiltonian for the whole universe is identically zero. The total energy of the whole universe is exactly zero, being a sum of positive energy of matter and negative energy of gravitational field. So we combine them together, we get zero. So in the right-hand side of the Schrodinger equation, I get zero, and therefore in the left-hand side, I have the speed of change of the wave function is zero. So the wave function of the universe which is supposed to describe everything and all changes and us talking and everybody recording, okay? This wave function does not depend on time, which means when our discussion is over, nothing changes and it is not recorded. Yeah. How could it be? Uh, yeah, it doesn't so, make sense. Yeah, so he suggested the resolution of this problem. And the resolution was, we never ask questions about the wave function of the whole universe. We ask the question about the wave function of the rest of the universe. We are observing oh. it, and here is the rest of the universe. Okay? So, we are observers, like me, well, say modestly, the weight, like maybe 80 kilograms, maybe <laughs> 90 kilograms, I will never tell. Okay? <laughs> and the rest of the universe. And our combined mass, which is mc squared, will give you total energy of everything it is equal to zero, which means that me is this 80 kilograms multiplied by c squared, and the universe is exactly minus 80 kilograms c squared, because the total thing must be equal zero. to zero. So the universe has minus my mass. <laughs> if I were small, then the universe, the rest of the universe, were small. If I am cut out of this, then the rest of the universe has zero mass and cannot change. Its wave function does not depend on time. So it starts depending on time on my watch only if I subtract myself and start observing the rest. So then, in a certain sense, the rest of the universe is alive only because I am alive. <laughs> this sounds extremely paradoxical. But that's what we have right now. We trust these equations. We just need some interpretation. Bryce David did not come to forward, forward too much to say that actually the rest of the universe depends on us human observers. He said that, well, actually observations can be made by some automatic devices. Just put the camera, start it watching, and the universe becomes alive. 
But then from my point of view, camera is a part of the rest of the universe. <laughs> I must observe it. So it just cannot cut me observing it out of the equation. And my observations is my consciousness. Without me recording it, all the rest of the universe will be dead. Well, then, of course, it is kind of strange, right? Because it presumes that consciousness may have some independent importance. Or maybe not, I do not know. But the thing is that if I want to study quantum cosmology, I want to have an answer to these questions. I want to consider these paradoxical situations honestly up to the end of it. And whatever answer comes, I will need to accept it. And this means that I must at least think about things like possible importance of consciousness for cosmology. Now that's very brave. Uh, consciousness is normally not something that physicists would approach in, in that manner because it has some philosophical or religious potential connotations. But I, I appreciate that. The obvious question one asks is that human beings or any sentient creatures were only around for, pick your number, 100,000 years, million years, but the universe seems to have been around a lot longer than that. Yeah, that is true. It seems to be around <laughs> much longer than as that. As if it were as around. As if it were around. And this brings me to interpretation of quantum mechanics in general. Usually, uh, uh, at least people belonging to a standard old Copenhagen school, they will tell that, um, well, everything becomes real at the moment when it is observed. You reduce the wave function of the universe and put it into a certain state after you observe the universe. Um, before you make an observation, there is no such thing as a real existence of anything there. But once you make an observation, Everything looks as if it existed all the time before it happens. So this is something which uh, um, may be uh, good to associate with the so-called theory of consistent histories. Mm. There is a consist when you observe that the galaxy is there somewhere in the sky, everything looks as if the galaxy was there even before I start observing it. And honestly, this is the only thing that we can say. Andre, could that mean that consciousness potentially has some irreducibility to it, some fundamental nature, even as, as, as fundamental as matter and energy? Well, uh, I don't know, but I really suspect that this may be the case. Um, but instead of uh, well, making a great theory out of it, I will uh, probably make some historical analogy. Yeah. Um, this may be just an analogy, but let me try. Um, so what happened when Einstein invented his uh, general theory of relativity? When he invented special theory, he just said that space and time is the same. Uh, well, we're part of some unity. When he invented general theory of relativity, before this invention, people thought about space and time like a set of numbers which do not have any independent existence. Mm -hmm. They are just necessary for description of a real thing, of mm -hmm. motion of matter, mm -hmm. okay? Then with general relativity, space and time acquired uh, their own degrees of freedom, say gravitational waves, okay? So even if you consider a universe without any protons and electrons, it still can breathe, it mm -hmm. still can move, it, uh, gravitational waves may still propagate, mm -hmm. okay? So you have this idea that space-time may exist without something which was previously called matter. Of course, you may say now that this is matter, but this is kind of afterthought, <laughs> okay? Now, later, when uh, uh, supersymmetry concepts came in power, and this was in 70s and 80s of this uh, of 20th century, people invented the concept of superspace. So superspace have normal coordinates and also fermionic coordinates. And using geometry of superspace, you can describe all particles as excitations of this geometry. So see what happened? First, you thought that matter is the only oh, thing I that think. matters. Then you said that actually space-time may have its own degrees of freedom. And now you say that actually matter may be a way of describing changing geometry of superspace. So then superspace becomes the 
top priority right now, the leading figure. Now so we started with matter being primary yeah. and, and operating within space. Then yeah. space became kind of equal. And, yeah. and, then, and then at the end, right. space became primary and matter uh, yeah. became a product. And now notice that the degrees of freedom of space, gravitational waves, have not been discovered yet. It, they just necessary for internal consistency of the theory. So think about consciousness. We think about it usually as something which is absolutely required for description of matter. Yeah. But could it be that consciousness, just like space-time, may have its own degrees of freedom and can exist without matter? And could it be that consciousness later will be, well, elevated to the level of superconsciousness, which will include matter as its part? I don't know the answer, but as any questions of this nature, this is the one which, when asked, it should be studied. So this conjecture about importance of consciousness, I included it into my book on inflation and particle physics, which I written in 1990. And my editor, she didn't like it at all. <laughs> and she told me that I should uh, remove it from the book because if it is there, uh, well, I will lose respect of all of my friends. Yeah. And I replied that if I remove it from there, then I will lose my own self-respect, which is much more important for me. So it is still in the book. <laughs> <laughs>